We are talking about the new normal, finding family in community, and this is part two. Pastor Mark did a great job last yeah. week. Where is he? Is he anywhere? <laughs> Pastor Mark back there, tremendous job. You know, God, God the Father is a family man. He is. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are a family. When he said, let us make man in our image, it was a family sentence. And so community is a part of who God is. It's part of the Godhead, and it's part really of who we are. We are a family. Um, we're created in the image and likeness of God, and he is a family. He is a family God that wants us to experience that. He calls us sons and daughters. Uh, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. These are not just idle little words that we use. This is a genuine relational connection. And, and if we're not a part of that, we're missing out really on the destiny, the, the legacy, the call of God in our life. So the family of God is God's plan for your life. It's his plan for your destiny. It's his plan for your healing. He has no plan B. There is no other plan than the family of God. And yet, all of us have been hurt by people. If you've not been hurt by someone, would you stand up? We want to hurt you right now. But anyone <laughs> who has not been hurt by a human being, everyone gets hurt. Everyone gets hurt relationally, and it causes us to kind of push away. I don't want to get hurt again. And yet, it's going to take courage. And we're going to talk about someone tonight who really had a lot of courage. He was hurt by his family an incredible wound, and because he overcame that healing, uh, he became what's known as a patriarch, a mighty man of God throughout history. And so uh, we're going to talk about Joseph and his family. Uh, you know, in the Bible, uh, we're going to see from this story some family values. We're going to see something that he did that really reminds me of my own natural family. Um, Susie, uh, is a handy, and the handies are an amazing clan uh, that I was able to marry into. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and she's from Browns Valley, California. So we had an Italian cowboy Hebrew wedding, of course. What else would you possibly have? And so um, it was 40 years ago, but um, I was engrafted into a wonderful family who I love very much. And um, on January the 31st, we had a family reunion. And, and I don't want to embarrass any of them, uh, but I do love them a lot. And a number of them are here tonight. A couple will be sharing. If you were there on that January 31st family reunion, would you stand up? If you were there in the room that night, there's a row there. There's a few trickling members there. Others may be coming tomorrow. I love you guys so much. This is my family. And so on that morning, I was uh, coming back. We were on a K-Love cruise. K-Love, uh, I do those every month uh, for the last six years. And I got to go on a free cruise. Can't beat that. Free flights, free cruise. Oh, I'm going. So we went and came back on a Saturday night, January the 30th. And the next morning, I was here in the service. And uh, Brett, who just gave me the guitar, was leading worship, 26 years old. And then Ryan, our youth pastor, Ryan, wave your hand. Ryan, 21, did announcements. And then Brandon, who just was up here, uh, one of our teaching pastors, was teaching. I'm sitting there just basking in the next generation doing an incredible job. I'm just loving it. And, uh, and then Robbie texted me, my nephew Robbie, who came back with Pastor Bob, but um, he's going to be sharing a little bit tomorrow in both services, but because he has uh, three, almost four uh, young children, I let him stay home tonight, and uh, he just arrived this afternoon. But Robbie uh, texted me and said, hey, can I talk to you after the service? Nine o'clock service, January 31st. And so he says, shares this sentence with me, his opening sentence as we sat down. He said, um, I've been reading Sean Smith's book on revival. Nobody reads a book on revival unless God is at work. It's not like light reading, you know? Uh, it's something that it's going to put you through some changes. And as soon as he says that, he says, we're having a family reunion tonight, and I really believe that God wants to move. And as soon as he said that, he began to just cry. And, uh, you know, it was a, a one of those tender moments. I was sitting in the second row with him, and I said, you know, Robbie, um, whatever happens tonight, I'm with you. I, I trust you. Uh, God's going to work through you tonight in a supernatural way. And so that night, I'm not going to go through the length of it. I'm just going to say that night was an extraordinary night. January 31st was a windy, stormy night uh, in Sutter, California, and uh, and. My brother-in-law, Joe, and Becky own a horse ranch there. They have 75 horses and a corral and a rodeo. And I taught Joe how to ride a few years ago, and it was a great experience. But uh, 
And so a couple, they have a few barns, but the barn we were in was a, a small barn, 45 of us or so packed in kids, but it was a stormy night and this old barn just rattled. I mean, it just was rattling. Robbie prayed over the food and somehow initially I made a comment. I said, you know, there's kind of a storm around us all, but we're huddled here as family. And it was, I knew that God had something in store. You just feel the atmosphere was palpable. I began to have conversations with a number of nieces and nephews, and they're sharing stories that are just mind-boggling of how God's working in their heart. They're surrendering their hearts to the Lord. They're, they're making movement. Uh, Susie's brother and his wife, or another brother who was going back to church again, been out for a number of years, and, and there's stuff happening. And then Robbie, um, at a certain point, begins to share. Now, <clears throat> Robbie, I- I'm going to, you know, just fawn him tomorrow, love on him, because he's an amazing guy. Robbie was like a first fruits of the next generation. Robbie, I called his wife just to get the remembrance of a sequence. I remember him standing up at a family gathering. It happened to be his reception for his marriage six years ago. He'd been coming to The Rock for about a year. They still drive down from Mary's Yuba City uh, every week. And uh, he stood up and he began to share what God was doing in his life at his wedding reception and just kind of drawing a plumb line saying, I'm going to serve Jesus Christ all the days of my life. And he, you know, he and his wife had a history, you know, their history was not serving the Lord and they were just making a decision. And I've seen Robbie as a credible person uh, year after year pursue the Lord with all of his heart. And all of a sudden, when he stood up at the family meeting, well, he's, he's got the beef, okay? He's got spiritual biceps. He has something to say that he is a credible source. And as he, as he does, he's not like an A-type personality. He's not, you know, fast-talking like me. He's just a clear, tender, humble person began to share his heart with his family about how the Lord was working in his heart. And it was real, it was genuine. And, and I want you to understand, the barn is going, <laughs> the barn's, you know, beating the wind. Everyone is completely silent. And you can sense just the presence of God, like tonight, just falling on that place. And a number of family members are nodding their head because they were there. And after he spoke, then Jerry, his cousin, spoke up about a commitment he had just made to the Lord. He and his wife surrendering their heart to the Lord at the beginning of the year. And, and then Aaron, who's here tonight, going to share in a little bit, sharing about her commitment. Then a, a teenager shared, I'm so glad that God's moving on my family with tears. She's crying. I mean, God's moving. By the end of the night, we had prayed over a a, a niece who's got cancer for 10 years, Megan, and her son, Hayden, who uh, is battling with leukemia and has lost a leg um, uh, through cancer. Uh, We anointed them with oil, and it turned into just a spirit. We have barbecue here, okay? It turned into the spirit of God moving then we prayed over another niece and, and her husband, and he just lost his dad. And, and then we said, close your eyes. If you want to pray to receive Jesus, and raise your hand and want to make a recommitment. And it was like, wow. And it was about, it seemed like it was an hour of God moving in our family. God wants to move in families. And you may have given up on your family, and they may have given up on you. If you're a follower of Jesus, that happens. People can just, you know what? I, I, I don't know where you guys are. You're another galaxy from where I am. But I believe God wants to redig the wells of family. When that happened that night, it, it began to alert me to the fact that family is on the menu. Family is what God is going to work on even tonight in this place. And so I thought of the scripture, John 3, 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from, or where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the spirit. And so the spirit of God wants to move, Jesus said. Um, and Isaiah talks about him doing something new, God doing, for I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers and dry wasteland. For some of your families, they're a wilderness. Some of your relatives are a dry wasteland. But how many of you, before you received Jesus, were a dry wasteland? Okay, how many of you were a wilderness? I didn't wake up the morning I got saved thinking I'm going to get saved. I walked into a church thinking I was God. (laughs) And I walked out knowing Jesus Christ was Lord, okay? I know that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But... That's, you know, stupid was what I was experiencing at that moment. And yet Jesus rescued my life. So Joseph has a response to his family. And there are amazing parallels to me to what Robbie did during that whole sequence to Joseph. Um, Joseph was the first fruits of his family. 
Susie was the first fruits of her family. I was the first fruits of my family. And Robbie was the first fruits of a new generation. And right in the middle of that whole event, Robbie looked at me and Jerry, his cousin, told me when I met with him the week after, said it was his favorite part of the night. I think it was my favorite part of the night as well. Robbie looked at me after he'd been, you know, kind of juggling the ball there, doing a great job. He looked at me and saying, kind of like Uncle Francis, why don't you take over? And, and I looked at him and I said, and the whole room was incredibly quiet. Again, you know, the whole thing, you know, stirred by the wind. And I said, Robbie, you're doing great. And your generation is now rising up. Because a number of them had shared, your generation is doing great. And I believe that. I believe there's another generation that is coming forth. And we who are older are just going to sit there and drool and just rejoice <laughs> as we watch them. I'm looking forward to that. So Joseph's scenario is there's a famine in the land. And his family is coming for food. And they don't know that he is their brother. And it's a terrifying experience initially. And so the basic scenario takes place in Genesis 45. After Joseph, you know, sends them back, does a whole number of things with them. Finally, he's about to reveal himself to them. And he says, Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood with him. Because they had sold him into slavery. They thought he was dead. They were jealous of him, and uh, consequently, uh, he could have had significant bitterness. He spent years in jail. You know, he was totally abused over and over again, and yet Joseph allowed his heart to become tender, which I believe, you know, for some of you in this room, you are a Joseph to your family. You are the best shot they have of getting saved. I'm telling you that right now. You're the best shot they have. And so you need to get whole enough to help your family. Because whether you know it or not, they're counting on you. You know, none of us feel really together. I, you know, I, I never, Susie could tell you, I never feel together. I just don't have that gene. Whatever that is, that incredible confidence, like I got it, no problem, no. I, I'm the most amazed person in the world that I'm leading anybody. And to me, the fact that I'm leading people just shows how desperate the situation is, okay? <laughs> but that is really your scenario too because all of a sudden, you're in play. And with your inadequacies and insufficiencies and all that, you're still someone that really potentially could be used by God to help your family. And so I'm gonna to talk to you about five, I believe, essential qualities that Joseph modeled that I believe Robbie modeled as well. Number one, healthy families are transparent, unguarded, and awkwardly honest. When Robbie began to share that night, you know, he's, he's protracted, he's slow, he's methodical, he's sharing it, but he's genuine, he's real, and he's honest. And everyone's listening. There's no one's like, uh, uh, Robbie, what are you talking about? No one's questioning. He's a credible person. And when he shared, it was impactful. When Joseph began to share, he shared honestly with them, finally. Uh, and verse two, he wept aloud so that as Egyptians heard him, the, he was, again, the head of the household there. They heard him weeping. I cry a lot. I cry more than my wife and daughters together. But, um, you know, there's things worth crying about. I cry for joy, I cry for sadness, I cry out of concern. You know, I think crying is a good thing. When my daughters grew up, I would, in the middle of the night, you know, I'm a little neurotic, I'd get up and sometimes I would kneel at their door and just cry over them, just cry that they would follow the Lord. For some of you who have kids that are far away from God or they're still in play or they're in danger, it'd be good if you cried over your kids. It'd be good if you, as their dad and their mom, just were burdened enough to cry out to God for their souls. <clears throat> because you may be, again, with the authority you have, be that person that could see them have a breakthrough. My mother prayed for me, and I got saved on Mother's Day. I hadn't seen her in nine months, thousands of miles away, but her prayers caught up with me, and it was because of her prayers. Number two quality, healthy families are vulnerably emotional. You know, if you're going to be safe and guarded and protected, and you're trying to keep your cool, and you have this whole little image and mystique you're protecting, well, don't be surprised if you're not credible. Don't be surprised if no one really thinks you believe what you really believe. If you're going to pray and, and minister to your family, they've got to see in you a genuineness. And so they've got to feel in you that you're going to risk everything to reach out to them. Because you care, you care more about them than protecting your little deal. And I mean that with all my heart. 
You know, even as a pastor, I'm not, I'm not concerned about presenting this little mystique about being together. I'm not that together. So there's no point in propping something up. And I got saved in a revival that was not together. And I wasn't together when I got saved. And so being a pastor, I'm not interested in the mystique of putting on these airs about something that I'm really not. And I don't want worship to be an atmosphere of people putting on airs. I want genuine people representing Jesus Christ in a vulnerable, transparent, awkward way. Because then we might actually see Jesus in a human being. I believe that. Continues, verse 3, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father alive? And his brothers couldn't answer him, for they were dismayed. The Hebrew meant they were amazed, they were frightened, they were terrified in his presence. You know, um, when, when Robbie shared vulnerably who he was, you know, Joseph shared who he was, and it brought the presence of God to that room. When Robbie said, God has been working in my life about my family, They all knew he loved them. They all knew he cared about them. But that vulnerable, not having, and blah, 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 you know, all the little religious trappings of sequencing something and some kind of a slick presentation, but he didn't have a conclusion to his sentence other than I'm on a journey and you're on my heart and I care about you. Some of us are looking, you know, for the precise words that are really going to touch your family. And, and that's the wrong way to look. Look for how could you share what God's putting on your heart that would make them know how much you care for who they are and how much you care about their future and their lives. And you may st stutter and stammer and, and whatever, but if at the end of the day they sense you're being the real deal, that will impact them more. Number three, healthy families are willing to experience pain together. You know, in our family, we have, I guess, I, people battling cancer, leukemia, some battle with drugs, some battling the grief of loved ones. You know, some, you know, teenagers are in play. They're, they're in play morally. They're in play attitudinally. They're not together. They're, they're still going through the teenage experience, but we care for them. We love them. We want them to do well, and we want them to know how much we care. Genesis 4, 45, verse 4 Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he says, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. God sent me before you to preserve life. God sent me before you to preserve life. You are there in advance of your family, some of you, to see them get rescued. You know, the day my father died, I was glad he dropped dead. It was a sad scenario. My twin brother and I just said, literally two hours before he dropped dead, we wished he would drop dead. Two hours later, he did in a political dinner. He'll be dead 50 years this December. I was 17 years old. We were angry. We were crying in the basement of our home. About We just had a fight with him that day. We were home from college. Didn't you know, live at home since we were 11, but uh, you know, it just was not a good deal. And yet when I wrote the book, Father Wounds, I just looked at it again. I gave a copy to someone this week. And as I read what I wrote, I said, to my earthly father, the one who hurt me the most, but also the one I look forward to seeing the most in heaven. I hope I will see you coming over the hills of heaven when I get there. How can God do that transformation? You know, where, you know, the person that you were glad he was dead now is the person you want to see the most. Who do you have ought with? Maybe that person, maybe the very person that if you got your heart healed, that that would be the catalyst for a move of God in your heart and their heart and maybe in your whole family. Number four, healthy families see God in their relationship. You know, none of our relatives are accidents. None of our history is an accident. You know, why was Joseph in Egypt? Well, he was in Egypt because his family sold him there. But he was also there because he's part of God's plan. He was there to be the rescuing agent for his family. All of Joseph's sorrows were for a purpose, to preserve his family. Joseph was a victim of men, but a victor of God. None of us, uh, none of it was for a loss, but for God's purpose. So God, I believe, wants to so heal our hearts that we could be that agent of change. Um, I was in a meeting this week uh, with 
my dear sister Joy, who with Pastor Joy, I love you. Joy Johnson, a great leader in this region. Her husband, Begay was here. And um, we were at a meeting with the police chief of Sacramento. You know, we've had in this room for the last 16 years, uh, many, many of the last few years here, uh, a, a gathering of honoring police and fire uh, in, in Roseville. 17th year is May 12th in this room. But God put on my heart, you know, across our nation, you know that within uh, diverse communities, that there's a strain, in particular, between police departments and African Americans. And, uh, and yet God has done something extraordinary and bring healing across aisles and denominations and races and geography in our region. And so God put in our heart to do something with the Sacramento Police Department. And so God was able to bring together key African American leaders and I show them a number of slides of unlikely friendships that have taken place in this region, myself and Joy as one, and many other relationships of slides. And, and two of the slides I showed them are this picture here. I'm going to mention that. These are two mighty men of God here, uh, Thomas Hogue. Um, and it says this, he helped me trust again, erasing my past fears uh, uh, based on prejudice. Thomas Hogue was raised in Louisiana. He's about 75 years old. He grew up when there was a white water fountain and a colored water fountain. And uh, he said every white man he met in Louisiana, if he ever shook their hand, that they would always wipe their hand after they shook his hand. And he said, when I met Don Pritchard, a pastor here, we have done life and ministry together now for almost 30 years. When I met Don and shook his hand, he didn't wipe his hand. And the irony here, go to the next slide if you would, the irony here is uh, Pastor Don, and these guys are having a bromance. It's an awesome thing. We love them. <laughs> but Pastor Don on the left considers Thomas a spiritual father. He's a father to him. He, he was a dad in his life at a strategic moment. And I just thought about family. Again, what God can do in bring healing in relationships. And what God wants to do, I will tell you, in that meeting that we had with about 20 key leaders in the region and the police chief and a few other um, Sacramento police. Uh, he walked out of there and he said, I have never felt so honored as I did in this meeting. And, and we believe we as the family of God are called to be healers of breaches. We are called, we're reaching across divides, whether they be speed bumps or grand canyons, and we're gonna see healing. And maybe you learning how to be healed in your own family might be that catalyst to go beyond your family to your neighbors, etc. Genesis 45, 15. So he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them and his brothers talked with him. There's lots of tears. And I want the um, worship team to come right now. And, and the last quality that Joseph demonstrated, that Robbie demonstrated as well, healthy families hope for the best for one another. So here are the qualities that we looked at today. And I want you to consider your family. Are you this in your family? Let's take a look at those five dimensions there. Qualities in our family reunion and healthy families. Our family was transparent, unguarded, and awkwardly honest. You know, for some of you, you're waiting for a relative to ask your forgiveness. For maybe they're 90%. But maybe the Holy Spirit's asking you to ask their forgiveness for your 10% without mentioning the 90. And who knows what those ratios are. Our family was vulnerably emotional. Our family was willing to experience pain together. When we huddled together, we began to pray over and anoint those who were sick with oil and just pray over them in a barbecue. The Spirit of God just came down. And we have some unsaved relatives. We have some relatives that are, you know, at this point, not following Jesus. And they were in the room. And, and, you know, they've been around for a while. And I wasn't there to embarrass them. But we were trying to minister to our family. And we are certainly open to love on them and did. Our family saw God in our relationships. Our family hoped for the best for one another. Uh, I've got a, a precious niece and her husband. Mo and Aaron, and they're going to come right now, and um, they shared with me that night, and they have a testimony. Why don't you welcome them, give them a hand as they come right now.
<laughs> so, thank you. First of all, thank you. We're extremely humble to be up here in front of all of you. And for me, extremely more humble for my friends that came from Yuba City to be here for us. Uh, we're going to be awkwardly honest at this moment. Here's a, little, here's a little Snapchat of our lives. My name is Mo LeBlanc. My, my story begins in a small town in Massachusetts. At age seven, my birth mom left and moved to Florida. I was raised by my dad and stepmom. When I was 19 and in the service, stationed at Beale Air Force Base, California, my birth mom and I reconnected on the telephone for the first time since she'd left. I talked with her two or three times over several more years. After two failed, unhealthy marriages and raising three boys, I met my wife, Erin. In 2011, after nearly 40 years, Erin arranged for my birth mom to visit us in California. My mother's ex expectations were a lot higher than mine. It was going to take time. My love for God, remembering my own mistakes in life, and his forgiveness to finally loosen the noose around my heart towards my mother. Two months ago, two of my brothers and our families met in Orlando with my mother. During a tearful discussion, I pulled my mother aside and forgave her for leaving. Many people tried to get me to do it sooner, but I needed to make sure that when I forgave my mom, there were absolutely no strings attached. That night, Jesus spoke to me, and I knew the time was right. I have three sons from my prior marriage and three stepdaughters, beautiful stepdaughters with Aaron. My family has been besieged by the enemy many times, but none worse than my middle son, who was battling addiction with opiates, the worst being heroin. Rehab hasn't worked. I've decided to use the tactic of tough love and battle this addiction through prayer and prayer only. I have no physical relationship with my son at this time, but he's forever in my thoughts and in my prayers. It's going to take my ultimate trust in our Lord Jesus Christ to win this one. Growing up Catholic and forced to go to church alone without parents only soured me for religion. I always believed but never committed to God the way he intended. I met my beautiful, spiritually driven wife in the spring of 2004. I began to see Jesus not only working in my extended family, but also within Aaron. Joe and Becky Handy, my father and mother-in-law have taught me so much about grace and the love for Jesus, more so through their actions than through their words. I am so thankful for Aaron and her family, which had given me a spiritual toughness, and I am no longer ashamed to be a Christian. I think he was a little bit nervous of me last night. He thought I was going to tremble and fall over. So I think he thinks I'm going to this morning, but I really won't, I promise. My story begins in 2004 when my own sin landed me in the middle of a divorce. I was raised in church, so I probably should have known better. But looking back, I never really understood the enemy's plan to keep me from my destiny. I have three beautiful girls, 16, 18, and 20. Mo and I have been married for 10 years, and I love that he shares his three boys' lives with me. In 2004, the real estate market was booming. I was enjoying the easy life. It didn't require me to take my spiritual life seriously. If only I had known then what I know now. As quickly as the market peaked, it also crashed. I enjoyed a short season of what I considered success and then years trying to recover. Sadly, I remember a conversation with my Uncle Francis that haunted me, but also taught me a huge lesson. He asked, how will you handle being successful in real estate? I had no idea how to answer that weird question, but today I can answer it. I crashed and burned. It wasn't just making money that was my problem. It was fantasizing about the life that I thought that I needed. I have felt the pain of seeing my daughters hurt because of my choices. I have felt bankruptcy, losing my house, and clinging to a God that I had always known was real, but had never really completely surrendered to. In the early years with Mo, I started selling insurance for financial stability. I daily squirmed, knowing I should be, knowing where I should be, but scared to return to real estate based on my past failures. 
While in my uncomfortable cubicle writing insurance policies, I heard the whisper of the Holy Spirit, I have created you for more than this. I'm embarrassed to say it took me three years to find the courage to trust that whisper. I tried many times asking Mo to let me quit and tell me he'd support me financially. He doesn't like that part of the story because he doesn't remember that part of the story. But you know how wives want their husbands to say something and they never do. That was one of those moments. It had nothing to do with the fact that he wouldn't financially support me. It had everything to do with the fact that I wanted to hear him say something that he wasn't saying to me. Then I heard the Holy Spirit whisper to me, I want you to trust me more than you trust your husband. Finally, I was ready. 2015 was my first year back to full-time real estate and my income almost tripled. God showed me that he was so worth trusting. My story involves divorce, but it also includes a new understanding of God's forgiveness, unconditional love, complete healing, and a husband I adore. I'm learning how to die to myself every day. It's painful, but in order to be more like Jesus, it's a must. I used to think life needed to go my way, but now I'm content to do it God's way. I'm beginning to see what my destiny looks like. I've always known that it would include helping hurting people. I'm now teaching a class at our local jail called Life Recovery. The first day that I left the jail after ministering to about 15 female inmates, I again heard the whisper of the sweet Holy Spirit. You've been locked up too, and today you can walk free. just came back from Saudi Arabia and Uganda. This is a, a son from one of, he's face standing, a son from one of Susie's brothers and the other brother, this is a daughter. As you probably knew, this was a daughter. But Robbie, I've asked Robbie to share. You know, um, I'm very proud of this guy. When I saw him at the reception, um, he was a, I was so crying, Susie, Susie never cries. And so I'm trying to keep it together. If you're gonna start crying, I can't look at you. I love you, but gosh. Um, it was courageous. I mean, he still had a little bit of smoke on him. He was just coming out of the world. But, but he had made, he drew a line in the sand and said, I'm gonna live for Jesus. And I want everyone to know, my family, my friends, my old party and friends, I want you to know, I'm gonna follow Jesus. And I believe that was a, a, you know, a stake you put in the ground that years later, even at the family reunion, when you stood up and I asked your cousins, um, you're a credible person, you're the real deal. So I'm gonna encourage you at, with your own families in a few moments. I've already asked you if you are potentially the healthiest in your family, if you are a spiritual leader in your family, well, you're gonna to have to fight for your family in a few moments, because you're here as a point person for your family, as Robbie was, and we're gonna see breakthroughs for our families. But what would you say to the folks in this room? Why did you step up for your family? Why did you share that testimony at your reception? And then why did you share on January 31st of this year with your family? If I had a choice, I'd be more on the Pastor Hasty cry two-year plan, but uh, <laughs> God's got a way of uh, softening the heart, and I find myself more on the, the Italian side. <laughs> but uh, yeah, back in six years ago, we just celebrated our sixth anniversary yesterday, and uh, well, just prior to that, we had our uh, reception party. We chose a private wedding, just family, and we invited friends and family. Like he had said, the dust hadn't even settled yet um, in my life and relationships of coming out of the world. And um, friends had began to understand that something different was taking place, but never made any kind of public announcement and didn't have time to, to have those individual conversations. Uh, so it just really felt um, God leading me to make a stand and using that opportunity um, to voice something different. It wasn't you know, you know when God's doing something because it's probably the last thing you want to do. And, uh, That's right. Amen. My heart was uh, pounding and anticipating, you know, what it's going to look like. And I'd rather just celebrate and enjoy the moment. Uh, but he said, I had more for you. And um, 
the people there, you know, they were, they were the closest friends who had seen me probably. <laughs> definitely seen me at some of my low moments. <laughs> and uh, I knew I was restored, but I knew it was also <clears throat> an opportunity to share, you know, what God was doing, the direction I was going. And uh, ultimately, my hope for them to join me. And then, uh, you know, it'd been, it'd been five, six years since, and God was moving, and I'd had relationships and conversations and expressed my hope for them and with family. And uh, I'm sure some of you can relate. Sometimes family is the hardest, the hardest ground, the hardest soil to try to till and, and work within. And... Um, a lot of awkwardness, but knew, um, like they said, uh, more was going to be caught than taught. And uh, my life to my siblings and family was going to speak way more volumes than the words I had to share with them. And uh, ultimately, this man sitting next to me was the reason for that. Um, as a, as a non-believer running from God, um, family get-togethers, I would, I would run into Francis and I couldn't look him in the eye. And it wasn't his words that he shared, the way he could piece together a message. I, it was the life he lived. And I said, if that's the real deal, when I ever make this commitment to follow you, Lord, I want it to look like that. And his wife, my Aunt Sue, <laughs> right beside her, the softer spoken, but nonetheless, the impact. And um, so when it came time, you know, this, again, family reunion, 40th anniversary, um, no intentions and desire to, to do anything but just be present and share. But the day before, I'm, um, and again, let me give you a little background. I'm three weeks into a fast. Um, I'm in the middle of Sean Smith's I Am Your Sign revival and uh, believing, you know, for something to take place, uh, but not thinking this is the night. And then, uh, again, God began to, to break my heart and, and uh, say, I want to do something more. We're celebrating more than 40 years of marriage. It's a great thing, but I want to do more in your family. And uh, then in church that morning, it began to break even more. And, uh, and I knew uh, I didn't have to do or create anything. God was present. It was coming. And so I just tried to follow his lead. And as uh, he shared with you, tried to pass the baton every now and then in the meeting. But uh, it is. It, you know, and that's the thing. Is I think too many times I think I have to create the harvest. I have to look hard to find those that I'm called to reach. And uh, God continues to show me he doesn't. He'll break our heart. I don't want my heart broken. But he'll break our heart and the cost of eternity was at stake. And not just the salvation moment, but a moment to have heaven come to earth, to see things change here and now. And uh, that was my hope for the ones I love the most. And uh, believing that I'm going to see that come. Robbie, why don't you invite, this is the baton being passed, why don't you invite <laughs> folks in the room that would like to stand I didn't prepare him for this, okay who would like to stand in the gap for their family and to come forward that they might take that step and then we'll pray for them yeah, like he said <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to repeat what he just said <laughs> No, but if, uh, if you do, and uh, again, um, if there's a man who's disqualified to be the lead point spiritual in his family, I think I can raise my hand with confidence and say that's me. Uh, but the thing is, you didn't pick it. God chose it. And you know in your heart right now, if that's true, if you're the best shot in your family and your group of friends, uh, you need to step out. You know that calling, that tug on your heart. You know, Francis has said it a number of times, but, and he shared it in this message, but it had a huge impact the years I've heard it is, you may be your, your family's best chance. You don't think it, you don't see it, but you may be the closest they come to seeing Jesus. And that stuck with me. And another thing he shared that uh, led up to the impact is, uh, he talks about revival and he says, when his grandkids look him in the eyes, and they said, what did you do? How did you step up? What did you do when it was during that? And he didn't want them to look at him, and he said he did nothing. 
He said he wanted to look with confidence and said, I surrendered. I was willing and able. Jesus, Father, I lift up this crowd, these hearts that have stepped out. Some of them, it took a big move to step out of that seat. Some of these have been leading these families and knowing they're their child, their son, their daughters, their brothers and sisters, co-workers, Lord. They may be the only chance they get to see what it looks like Jesus in the flesh. Father, a lot of inadequacies in this group, most of all me. But Father, we have you living within us, the Holy Spirit, that's going to enable us, that's going to set up divine opportunities and moments that will see you move and break down walls. We will see you come through and create opportunities that only you could set up. We're going to see hearts of the closest, of the hardest walls that are built, the thickest, calloused hearts melt in front of us because of your love. Father, I pray for this group that's standing, that's committed, that's saying, let it be through me. When the Lord asks who will go, they said, I am here. Use me. Father, we just pray. Help us. Lead us. Guide us, God. Provide for us as we look and search. God, let us know and ask for you to lead us daily to look for those moments. Let us understand the significance that our actions will speak volumes, Lord. Above the verse we can repeat, God, but the encouragement we can share, God, that our lives right here, as we walk this out, God, as we leave this building and we go back to our families, we step out into our workplace, that you, Jesus, you will move, God. And the day is not over. If we're breathing, we still have a chance. I remember having a, a callous heart thinking I've shared. It's been six years. That sibling hasn't responded. That sibling, And I'd be, get discouraged and I would give up. But that morning of the reunion, God reminded me of his faithfulness. He didn't give up on me when I was running for 10 years. When I knew the conviction in my heart, and I began to just feel it and numb it day after day. He's been so faithful to us standing here. He's shown us how quick he is to respond. Don't give up on that family member. Don't yeah, give up yeah, on that yeah, loved one. Yeah. It may be tomorrow. It may be 10 years from now. Yes, but I ask you to press in. God, give us the strength and the courage, the endurance to run the race, what you call this marathon of life. And we will see around us, God, revived hearts. But it begins with a revived heart in us. A repentant heart, Lord. Forgive us for doubt and discouragement. Forgive us for the judgment, God. Forgive us for walking in fear. We're going to believe, God. We're going to raise our trajectory this year. Today as we go out, we're going to believe for those who seem like a long shot. And we're going to contend in prayer. And you're going to melt our hearts for them. And we're going to see people come to the Lord that we said never had a chance. And only God can do that. Only God can tear down that wall. Only he can mend that wound. I know you're moving, God. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for what you're doing. Not just in this place as we got to go to a few different countries and see and hear stories. I tell you, God is moving. God is moving. His spirit is amongst his people throughout this world. He's doing things only God can do. And I believe we're entering the season that this church has been contending for with others for a number of years to see our hearts revived. People will look at you differently. They will see in you Jesus and say, I don't know what you call it, but it's different. And I want it. And you're going to be quick to respond with the name of Jesus and how they can receive it. Bless this group, God. Prepare these hearts.